Emmanuel. Please stand and join us. Good morning. I want to welcome you here this day. I'm glad that you are able to be here and thank all of those joining by internet. We thank you for logging in and, and tuning in with us today as well. I hope that each of you had a tremendous Thanksgiving this week. I, I hope it was a great experience. Uh, even though there's a lot of great food, I hope you enjoyed the family being present with you and just being able to spend time with them. That's, a, that's the most important part of it and uh, just spending time with family and giving thanks for them and for the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his work in, in your life and in the lives of others. Uh, let me mention a few announcements. A bi a men's, uh, adult men's Bible study will be tonight at 6 and uh, Wednesday night supper. Uh, if you haven't signed up, please do on the bulletin board out front. If you forget to sign up, just call the office, typically by lunch on Tuesday. If you can, that way uh, they'll have time to make sure they add the numbers because they usually uh, go on Tuesday and get the items that they need for that. Jug man practice will be December the 7th at 10 a.m. And uh, so remember that. And Deacon Christian Fellowship will be at, at Weidman's this year on the 9th at 6 p.m. So if you haven't signed up, please let us know if you're coming. That way we can give an accurate count to Weidman's, uh, how many to expect. Uh, Ladies Christmas Fellowship will be Monday, December the 13th at 6.30 p.m. And that will be here at the church and you're asked to bring a $10 ornament, Christmas ornament. And uh, so remember that if you would. And I would also ask you to continue to pray for the Music Minister Search Committee. I know that you have been and I'll ask you to continue to do that because uh, they definitely need your prayers as they move forward. Pray for the right person to, uh, uh, to, to be placed in their lap and also pray for the church to be prepared for that person when they get here. So if you would, please join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of being able to worship in a corporate setting. Thank you this week that we've been able to celebrate with friends and family and just enjoy a time of Thanksgiving. The most thankful thing that we have, uh, the, most thing, the most that we should give thanks for, is our salvation. Father, we thank you for that because we know without that there would be no hope for us in this world, but through that, we're here today. We're here to worship, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you. I pray that you do a work in our lives and in our hearts this very moment and remind us that your grace is sufficient. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Also, uh, choir practice is today at 5 o'clock in the choir room and Wednesday evening at 545. We're going to be doing a lot of special Christmas music, so y'all come join us. Now, if you'll stand, we'll sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
Thank you for that. I appreciate that so very much. And thank you, choir. I appreciate that as well. Today we're going to be taking our text out of Acts chapter 27. We're going to look at verses 9 through 12. I'm going to refer to some more verses in there. And, and I want to uh, preach a message today titled, When the Warning is Ignored. And uh, we all know what warnings are, and, and hopefully by the end of this message we will, we will uh, draw closer to Christ. And uh, that's the important part is that we, we get a little bit closer to Him in our walk every day, or should anyway. And uh, as I begin, before I read, let me give you a little background information to kind of catch you up. Paul had went to Jerusalem. He had left Caesarea, went to Jerusalem, and there his intent was to spread the gospel. But when he got to Jerusalem, uh, he encountered Festus and the uh, chief priest and scribes. They had all rose up against Paul, and, and uh, they wanted to imprison him. And uh, needless to say, he did wind up in prison. But Festus wanted to transfer him to Caesarea, back to Caesarea, to keep him in prison there. And uh, the point was that he would be a little bit safer there rather than being in the middle of Jerusalem because Jerusalem would be a hot spot for him where uh, there could be riots and all sorts of things that could happen. And so he did. He moved him back to Caesarea. And he spent a couple of years there. And uh, it, one of the things that he did was appeal to Caesar uh, so that he could uh, go before Caesar. And, and in a moment, I'm going to show you, matter of fact, the last verse of chapter 26, verse 32, uh, if you look at that, it tells us that, that Agrippa and Festus had a conversation where they said, this man might have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. But the idea was that Paul wasn't seeking his freedom. He was seeking to offer freedom, and he had a platform to where he would be able to go before Festus, and, I mean uh, uh, Caesar, and he would be able to offer him freedom, the freedom of Christ. And that was a place that he would never have been able to go without having been in the situation he was in. Paul was one of the few people that you run into, especially in the scriptures, that he sees every opportunity to spread the gospel of Christ. And he saw everything as a platform, as a way to get the gospel in. And so as he, as he moved on in, he saw that as an opportunity to, to go before Caesar, not to appeal for his freedom, but to appeal for Caesar's spiritual freedom and eternal freedom. And that was the whole point of it. And, um, but they were about to transfer him to Rome so that he can go before Caesar. And they, they get a ship together. They're about to head out of, of Italy, or head to uh, Italy, that is. And they're going to go to several different places before they get to where they're going. Uh, one of the, the people that was assigned to him in verse 1 of chapter 27 was a centurion soldier named Julius. And Julius would be with him and the other prisoners throughout the entire journey. He was assigned to them. He would stay with them. He was familiar with Paul. He was familiar with the other prisoners. And they were about to embark on this journey together. And a lot was going to happen on this journey. And uh, it was going to be a unique experience. And Paul would once again have a platform through the hardships that came into his life to share the gospel. And it all started because a warning was ignored. And sometimes warnings come into our lives and they're, they're actually good things. We often think of warnings as harsh and difficult, uh, but you know, not all warnings are harsh. Not all warnings are difficult. That's not what they're meant to be. Warnings are meant to spare us from problems and trouble that we don't have to go through that are much avoidable. And so we want to heed the warnings when they come our way. In this passage, it says this, beginning in verse 9. It says, Now when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion, now I want you to listen to this verse, was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also. If by any means they could reach uh, Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest, 
and winter there. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to open this word up today. And I pray, Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to bear witness in our hearts and lives and remind us that your grace is sufficient, that your love is never ending, and that sometimes warnings are not given to harm us as we may perceive them to be, as we think of them often, but they're, they're given to spare us. They're given to help us. They're given to protect us and to keep us on the right path. And Father, I pray, I pray today that the power of your Holy Spirit will be present in this message and in this place, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. As we, as we look at this, Paul was making the final voyage of his life. Now, I want you to, this is real important. Paul, when he would get to Rome, he would wind up spending his final days in a Mimertine prison there. It would be from that Mimertine prison that he would pin the epistles to Timothy. And he would tell Timothy to cut straight, and he would tell him how he should do things. And, and it was one of the prison epistles that was very important. But it was Paul's last days on this earth. This was his last joy, uh, 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 I'll get it out in a minute, his journey. That's what I'm trying to say, his last voyage and journey. And so he wanted to seize the opportunity to share the gospel with Caesar. He had been in in uh, Caesarea, and now he is headed there. But as they went, they made their way. They wound up at a port called Fair Havens. And Fair Havens was not a suitable port for winter, to winter in. They would have to stay there all winter, meaning that they would have to have supplies. They would have to have everything necessary to make it all winter with, with the prisoners, with the crew, with everything that they had. And um, it was just not going to be suitable. But Paul advised them to winter there because he knew that a storm, that the winter was there and that storms would come and go and that disaster was imminent. He knew this. He knew this for several reasons. One, possibly because the Spirit of God led him to know this. Uh, the second reason is because he was experienced with the sea. He knew all about this. And so he just simply had some experience that told him, this is not a good thing. I want you to know, I'm not taking away from the divine side of things, but I want you to know this, that some division, uh, decisions in life that we make, they're not necessarily divine decisions, they're just common sense decisions. They're decisions based on experience, what we know that will happen, what we, what we see, what we've gone through in our lives, what we've seen others go through, what we've seen happen as a result of something. So it's a common sense decision. And yes, there are some decisions that are supernatural, divine in nature. And I believe that maybe God did warn him of this, but he also knew how things would be in, in this particular setting. He knew what was coming. He knew what they would be facing. And so Paul issues a warning. He tells them, this is not a good idea. We really need to winter here. But nevertheless, things would, would begin to change for them as the warning was ignored. On many occasions, warnings are ignored. And there are reasons for that. I'm going to share some of them with you. We wonder why warnings are even issued, especially when they're going to be ignored. We don't always know they're going to be ignored. In most cases, when we ignore warnings, there are consequences and a cost associated with that. There's something that's going to happen as a result of doing something that we know better than to do. And so we need to be careful. We need to be very careful of the way we live, the way we heed warnings in the Bible. God issued a lot of warnings. He issued warnings to his people, and he issued warnings that apply to you and me. He, he issued these warnings so that we could stay on the right path, so that we would be aware of the dangers that are out there when we go out into the world and face basically what I'll say is the storms of life. When we face that, it is a difficult thing. Paul was always concerned about people. He was concerned about everyone else more than himself. He was concerned about getting the message out. He was concerned about getting the word of Jesus out. He was concerned about uh, getting Timothy on the right path and getting uh, other churches and, and, and other situations, getting them on the right path and keeping them there. He wrote constantly so that he could get the word out that would guide people and spare them a lot of trouble and catastrophe in their lives. I've looked back 
And there are many different warnings that I've had in my life that as I look back, I'm glad I heeded. There are a few that I wished I had have heeded. There are a few that I wish I had have listened to. And, and when we think about warnings, we often think about something that's very harsh. We think about something that's very difficult, but that's not always the case. The warning that Paul issued here was not a harsh warning. Paul wasn't issuing a stern, harsh warning or a threat. Paul said, if we continue this, there's going to be a loss associated with this. We're not only going to lose the cargo, we're not only going to lose the ship, we're going to lose lives. People are going to die if you make the wrong decision here. Paul wanted them to know this, but yet they pressed on. Let me share with you first, when the warning is rendered, now we realize, you and I both know, that sometimes we say things are warnings, but they're really nothing more than threats. People will threaten you and consider that a warning. But the type of warning that I'm referring to is not a threat. A threat always means you do it my way or this is going to happen to you. A warning says, I'm going to give you a choice, and if you do it my way, it's going to spare you from the problems. These problems will be brought on not by me inflicting them in you, but by you rejecting the right thing. And as a result of that, it will follow you. There will be things that, uh, that consequences that come with that. Paul, his warning was for the good of everybody on the ship. It was not just for his good. It was not just for the good of the prisoners, but it was for the well-being of every crew member on that ship. It was not just for the cargo. It was not just for the ship. It was for the lives of the people there. Paul foresaw what was laying ahead of them. And the helmsman should have realized it too. If you stop and look at this situation, the helmsman, the man who drives the ship, the man who guides the ship, was the man who should have known what was laying ahead of them because he had spent an enormous amount of time on those waters. He knew what was out there. He had experienced what was out there. He knew what the waters could do. He knew how things could turn in a moment's notice. As a child, I remember going out in a boat with my dad and we had a few other people with us and we were in Sardis Lake in North Mississippi and the water began white capping. And I want to tell you, from that point on, I'll finish the story in a minute, but from that point on, I still fished, but if the water ever started white capping or was white capping when I got to that boat ramp, the first thing I did when I got to the boat ramp was go home. When I was on there, on the lake, and it started white capping, the first thing I did was got to the boat ramp, and then I went home. Let me tell you what white capping water did in my family in 1969. My grandmother, my father's mother, was in a boat in Sardis Lake. The water began white capping. Her and her brother were out there, she and her brother, and he ignored the warning. The boat capsized, and she died of hypothermia. The warnings are real. And we should be aware of them. The helmsman of all people was probably more familiar, even more than the ship's owner. He was more familiar of what lay ahead of him. He knew the dangers out there. He knew what would happen. He knew what could take place. And yet, he failed to heed the warning. The helmsman was the one who was at the core of the ship. He knew how to guide it in rough waters. He knew to avoid rough waters if at all possible. He knew to harbor when the storms would come. And folks, let me go ahead and tell you that we need to harbor when the storm comes. That means, when I say that, I mean we need to rest in Jesus when the storms come and let Him provide what we need. Let Him get us where we need to go. Let Him do what we need done in our lives. I believe they were facing deadlines and did not want the burden of dealing with prisoners throughout the winter. They would have to feed everyone. And sometimes when, we, when the warning is rendered, 
we're facing deadlines and we're thinking of that and we're thinking of all that we have to do and we're thinking we really don't have the time to wait all winter here. We don't have the means to feed all of these people. We don't have the way to take care of them and we, we certainly have to keep everybody warm. It's going to be a little bit colder on the water than it would be on the land. There's a lot of different things that are going on at this point. They would have to guard and feed the prisoners and that would be one of their responsibilities that were above and beyond their normal daily routine of keeping the ship afloat and keeping things moving. There's no doubt it would be a burden, especially if one managed to escape. Because then, Julius the centurion would have to explain that, and you know what? That could cost him his life. There was a whole lot of lives at stake in many different areas rather than just sinking on a ship, rather than being washed overboard, rather than all of these things happening. There would be consequences for the guards, and they would have been grave. The helmsman, in my opinion, seemed a little bit overconfident. He seemed a little bit too confident in, in his ability. He probably, like most people, had the attitude or thought that it won't happen to me. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but we've all, at some point in life, someone has told us something and we've had this mindset, it won't happen to me. Let me tell you, it will happen to you. It will. Even with a knowledgeable crew, even with experience, they were no match for what Mother Nature could dish out. And they thought this one time they would be able to simply escape what was there. Paul warned them. It wasn't a harsh warning. When Paul warned them, he said, listen, listen, I, I want you to know I'm concerned about all of us and I'm concerned about you all, and I don't think this is a good idea. I think this ship is going to sink, and we're not just going to lose all of the cargo in the ship. We're going to lose, you, you all are going to die. You all are going to die. And, and you could almost see the helmsman when he begins to think about this, when he begins to mull this over. Maybe the helmsman thought, who do you think you are to tell me how to drive a ship? And sometimes that's another story. We don't like to receive the warnings because we don't want people telling us what to do. How dare you tell me what to do? Sometimes if you tell someone what to do, then they just simply will not do it. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. A friend of mine, he was trying to get a drum, a brake drum off of the rear of a vehicle. He was pulling and he was prying and we were teenagers. And his dad came by and he said, Dad, how do I get this drum off? He said, take a hammer and hit it. Hit it between the lugs. He said, I don't want to put it on, I want to get it off. He said, okay. His dad walked off. An hour later he came back by and we're we out there still pulling and prying on that drum, about to give up. He said, Dad, how do I get this off? He said, I've already told you how to get it off. He said, would you show me? He took the hammer and said, boom, and the, the, jump, the drum jumped off. We, we were out there, we were teenagers, we were out there forever doing this, and we didn't want to listen. We wanted someone to tell us, but we didn't want to listen when they actually told us because in our mind, we couldn't understand how that was going to work. We couldn't understand the vibration. We couldn't understand what hitting that would do. But I'll tell you, a lesson learned sometimes is a good one. And so we learned something very important that day. When we think of a warning, we usually think harshness, but this is not it. This is not a harsh warning. Let me tell you, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, there were seven churches in Asia, seven of them. And in every one of those churches, Jesus Christ himself issued a warning to. But I want you to know his warning wasn't as harsh as you may think it was. Please note this. He told one church you're dead. He told one church you've departed from your first love. He told one church you're lukewarm. And it goes on and on and on. 
And he said, this is what you need to do. Why do you need to do this? So that you can avoid the judgment that will come if you don't do this, the judgment will come. He gave a warning, but he also gave an outing. Jesus never warned us that he didn't give us a, a, a chance and an opportunity to escape the judgment that he warned us about. That's not harsh, the harshness, that's love. And so, when we think about Paul, Paul didn't want the outcome of that to happen to everybody. Paul, he was fond of these people. I mean, he'd been with Julius for a long time. He, he had known Julius for some time. And Julius trusted Paul. But as Paul met new people along the way, they didn't really know Paul. But I, I want you to know, Paul was one of those people that there was always something different about him. There was something that was not usual. Paul was the kind of person that would grab your attention when you would meet him. It would be something that would, would captivate you and, and pull you to him because there was something about him and that something was Jesus that was different than anything that other people had. Paul was concerned about the crew and the prisoners. But I also want you to notice the second thing. When the warning is rejected, now I want you to know, notice this. When the warning is rejected, now this is by choice. Please notice this. They rejected this by choice. They actually did this, it seems, in a democratic way. They had a democracy going on. The majority wanted to sail on. And that, that means they really thought about this. They didn't want to be cold all winter. They didn't want to sit in the water in that harbor that could not supply all of their needs. And so when we consider warnings, they're to prevent avoidable catastrophes or catastrophic outcomes. Sometimes we give in to pressure even when we know better. We refer to that in certain age groups as peer pressure. We know better, but let me tell you, you don't have to be a teenager to give in to peer pressure. We often look down on teenagers for yielding to peer pressure, but let me tell you, there are a lot of older people that give in to peer pressure. There are a lot of other people that give in to the crowd, that give in to the influence and the sway of the crowd when they begin to pull on you and they, they begin to question why you are standing against them. And so I believe this is what happened to Julius the centurion. It says that he was persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship. So he listened to Paul, and, and I believe he even knew that Paul was right. But you have these two men, the owner of the ship and the, centur uh, the helmsman, and they say, we can make it. We can do this. We have the experience. We've been this route before. We know what we're doing. We've, we've done this a hundred times. We know what we're doing. Let me tell you something. You can do something a hundred times, but it doesn't take but one time to get you in trouble. That's all it takes is one time. One time that goes wrong, then things happen in the wrong way. And so it proved to be that the helmsman and the ship owner were a little more persuasive than Paul. And so the centurion gave in. Several years ago when I was in Colorado, we had a guy, we were about to go up in the mountains, and he told us, I know Billy Moles mentioned something of this effect uh, when he was here, but he told us what to pack, what we needed to take. And I did exactly what he said. I just assumed that he knew what he was doing, and I put exactly what he said in my pack. And I want to tell you, that afternoon, as soon as the sun went down, I knew why he wanted those things in our pack. I've never, it's not like that in Mississippi. I want you to know that. When the sun goes behind the mountain in Colorado, you're looking for clothes immediately. The temperature plummets drastically, and it does it quickly. And so when the mountain goes behind there, it's just like you cut the heater off. Everything's gone, and you're like, oh, my. Now I know he knew what he was talking about. And I had no further questions about anything that he said. He proved himself to me. But as, as Billy Moles pointed out, 
in his time as a guide, a hunting guide, no one ever listens. They always put more than they need. They do this and they put that or they take this out. And after a good day of hiking, they go back. If, when they make it back to the camp, they take all of that extra luggage out. They don't want to carry that stuff around trekking up and down those mountains. And when we consider what Paul is doing, he's telling them exactly what they need. We need to harbor here. We need to stop right here. We need to allow ourselves to survive the winter. That way we can move on and everybody's going to be safe. Paul had been around also. Paul had traveled by ship on missionary journeys and he knew how lethal the winter and the seas could be. He knew what a combination that would be. He understood it. And he knew how rapidly things could change and go downhill. He was very much aware of that. And so, Paul had the knowledge and he did have the experience, but he was a little bit outranked as a prisoner. And so when you consider being a prisoner, nobody wants to listen to a prisoner. Nobody wants to listen to Paul. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know this, but I suspect that Julius and Paul had an additional conversation that we maybe not even know anything about. I'm pretty sure that I, in my heart, I believe that Julius went to him and said, Paul, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gave in, but I did. He may not have. That's my opinion and my opinion only. That's not in the scripture. This passage is to give us the gist of things, to give us the purpose of it, to give us the, the situation that they encountered. The warning was rejected. And as it was rejected, it was about to get rough. When they left Fair Havens, if you look on down in verse 13 and following, it says that the south wind blew softly. But if you read a little bit further, things began to change. It began to get drastic afterward. And, and it did get so drastic that everything was lost except the lives. And we'll get to that in a moment. There are always going to be people who are not going to believe you. And you just, you have to accept that. I have to accept it. There are people that are not going to uh, believe you when you talk about Jesus. They're going to give you every uh, excuse that they can why they don't. And folks, it's not about their excuses. It's about accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But now let me warn you with this. I want to issue a warning. We sometimes lump people into two categories, good and bad. Typically, when we refer to bad, we refer to the lost. But I want to tell you, there's a lot of bad saved people, too. I want you to hear me on this. And there's some lost people that are actually better than the saved people as far as their moral and ethical behavior. Not better as a person, but better in their behavior. Maybe they have better etiquette. Maybe they have better mannerisms. There's all sorts of things that that maybe they have that are better. But I want to issue a warning. Maybe we as Christians need to step up our game a little bit, so to speak. Maybe we need to step it up and model Jesus in our life in a world right now that does not know Jesus. Maybe we need to model instead of condemnation. Maybe we need to model His love. It doesn't mean you have to accept everything that comes along. It doesn't mean you have to give in to every helmsman that comes into your life and says, we can do this. But what it means is that we can listen to the polls when they come along that warn us of the dangers. When we read the Bible, there's warning after warning after warning that we should live right, that we should do the right things, that we should glorify Jesus in the way that we talk, in the way that we act, in the things that we participate in. There's always people who will not believe you and they will not believe that it will happen to them. There's always going to be someone that will do something not believing that there's going to be any consequences for them. They're different. They're different. It won't happen to me. I'm different. But yes, it will. Now, how many of you remember the first time you were driving a car? Uh, you, you learned, maybe at whatever age, you're driving a car and you've got this thing under control. But all of a sudden, you lose control of it. When you turn, it doesn't turn. You want to go straight and it's not going straight. 
Do you remember that feeling of the loss of control? We think that it won't happen to us. Now, I can remember vividly every wreck that I've been in, and I want to tell you, I didn't like any of them. I can remember those on an ATV when I thought it wouldn't happen to me. I can, I can remember those. And I can remember them just like they were yesterday. And what happens is over time, that creates a sense of caution in us. We begin to learn, well, you know what, if I do this, there might just be an outcome associated with this that I don't like. This might be worse than you ever imagined. This could be more than you thought it could be. But things like that happen. People sometimes won't believe you. They think that they're invincible. They think that it cannot happen to me. And let me tell you, there are a lot of people out here that believe because they have been to church a few times. Maybe their name is on a, a roll. Maybe they've attended Sunday school. Maybe they've even been baptized. And they believe that because they've done these things that they're going to heaven and they think that it can't happen to them that they go the other direction. They can't, it can't happen. But I want you to know it can. If you don't accept Jesus Christ, not only can it, it will. But I also want to assure you that if you accept Jesus Christ, you will go to heaven. But as I've said multiple times, let me say again, we think that just making that profession, just saying it, just doing these things, that's all we need to do. That brings you salvation, but the evidence of salvation is a changed life. And sometimes one of the dangers about being a Christian for a period of time is we think that we don't need to change anymore. We think, well, I've been a Christian for a long time, preacher. I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. You probably have. doesn't mean that you're through changing. Can I tell you that we're going to change? We're going to grow closer to Christ every day in our life. You should be growing as much as a mature Christian as an immature Christian. You should be getting closer to God every day. We should be growing. We should be learning. And when we read the Bible, we should discover new things, and, and we do. We, we discover things. We've read over and over and over. I told someone not long ago, one of the dangers of reading the Bible is overlooking a passage that we're familiar with. Well, I've read that a hundred times. Try it again and slow down. Try it again and pray for the Holy Spirit to open it up to you before you read it. See if it'll make a difference to you, and you will be surprised at what God will reveal to you through that. But the third thing is when real, a warning becomes a reality. When it happens, the oh no, what have I done begins to set in. And the results of the bad decision and the realization of what the situation is hits like a ton of lead. Imagine what this is going to be like. Imagine what it's going to be like when someone stands before Jesus and Jesus says, depart from me, ye who work iniquity, I have never known you. And they're going to say, but I've been baptized. I am a member of Oak Hill Baptist Church. I've been to this. I've read chicken soup for the soul. I do all of these things, but depart from me, you who work iniquity. I have never known you. The oh no was set in. What have I done? But it's going to be too late then. You see, after after the fact, after the shipwrecks, after it happens, it's too late. It's too late to get it back. It's too late to do it all over again. The oh no is going to overwhelm you. The oh no is going to be more than you think you can handle, but it'll only get worse from that point. This passage is about a shipwreck and the lives that were going to be lost. And Paul turned the situation into opportunity. Please notice that Paul didn't get into a blame game. Paul didn't get up there and start saying, I told you so. You should have listened to me. 
And I want to tell you, I say this with my children, and I'm sure that my parents have said it with me. There were a lot of times that they didn't say that, but they sure thought it. And I've, thought, I've done that as well. I thought, mm, I'd really like to say I told you so, but no, 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 I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get into the blame game. I'm not going to say you could have avoided this. The situation is what it is, and now we have to pick up the pieces where we are and move forward. And that's what Paul did. He turned the situation into an opportunity. And let me tell you, when people are going through hardships in life, when they're going through crisis, whether it's self-inflicted or not, that provides a platform for you to share the love of Christ with them. It's not just a word. Jesus said, it's not enough to tell somebody that's cold and, and hungry, be warmed and filled and do nothing for them. He said, you have to actually give them something to eat and drink. Something to, to, and, and help them to warm up. When you do this, he says you've done it to him when you do it to the least. In other words, the actions and words begin to work in harmony. And so we draw the comparison between good and bad people. You know what? We're all people in this world and we all experience the same things. We all make bad decisions. We all have put ourselves in situations and maybe even our families that we wish we could go back and change, but we can't change them. And what we have to do is pick up from here and move on. But I want you to understand this, that if we want to make a difference, we need to put Jesus in the center of everything we do. And that's what's important. Because you see, that would help us to make the right decisions. Sometimes people refuse to accept the outcome. It doesn't change the situation. You can reject it all you want. Several years ago, there was a gentleman who had been connected to our church that was headed to prison. And uh, he had got out of prison and he had... Um, Somehow or another felt that he didn't have to follow the rules that they had for him, and he didn't. And so his, in his mind, he decided that he would just avoid his next meeting with his parole officer. Well, if he avoided it, there would be no circumstances that would follow that, he thought in his mind, or there would be no consequences for his actions. But then what that did was put him in a situation where he became wanted in our county. He became one of the top 10 most wanted. And he was arrested. And so I went to the court that day, and while I was waiting on him, I just sat in. It was several people that went before. And there was one man that went before him. He had committed of a crime and had committed a crime and was about to be sentenced, and his attorney stood up and he said this, I advise you to remain silent through this entire process. You know what he did? He opened his mouth and would not shut up. And by the time he got through, I thought, man, this guy's gone. And, and the attorney said, I've warned you to remain silent. And finally, the judge, what he did was revoke bail and sent him on. He sent him on into the back without bail. He transported him back from the courthouse over to the jail without bail. He refused the warning. Somehow or another, he thought he could talk his way out of it. Somehow or another, he thought he could say the right thing that would just suddenly they would take the handcuffs and the shackles off and uh, go on back out. It's okay. But it didn't happen that way. And it's a harsh thing to experience. And when people get to that place, they suddenly think that they're immune from the consequences of their actions. And they don't have to follow warnings. Throughout the Bible, God issued warnings to his people. The warnings usually started out very casual, meaning that they were low-key, this is what you need to do. Matter of fact, if you go back and look at the Levitical law, the Mosaic law, you'll see that all of those were warnings. If you do this... Everything's going to be good, but if you break one of these, this is what's going to happen. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Consider this in today's terms. 
The church is under attack. The Christians are under attack. You can believe what you want to believe in our country, and that's good. You can believe whatever, and I, and I like freedom of speech, although that's being taken away from us. We worry about the Second Amendment. We need to be concerned about the First Amendment. But the freedom of speech is being removed. We can say whatever we want. I, I agree with that. But I also want you to know that when we consider these things, when we consider where we are, we're free to do things, but we must understand the consequences when we do them. There's a, there's a price to be paid when we refuse the warning. You see, he gave them a casual warning, and then sometimes when they failed to heed the warning, it would get harsher after that. Usually his warnings followed up with an additional warning. And then the third one, which usually that was it. That was, that was, that was pretty much it. Think about Amos. He warned them three times. He said, the fourth one, that's it. The fourth warning, that's it. Three strikes and you're out, so to speak. When we consider the warning, I want you to consider this. The warning is simple. If you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will burn in hell the rest of your life. And that's harsh. But it's the truth. And we really need to consider that. Ephesians 5.15 warns us that we're to live carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Romans 12.2 warns us that we're not to be conformed to the world's standards, but to be conform to God's standards. 3 John chapter 1 and verse 11 warns us not to imitate evil, but rather to imitate good. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 warns us that we should follow the example of Christ. Now he tells us what we should do. These are all for our benefit. Now please note this. In this next section, they got into the storm that Paul warned them about. And what they were going to do was they were going to kill the prisoners so that none would escape. And they would be able to go back and say, we got into a storm, but we made sure that none of the prisoners escaped so they would be free. But the centurion that was close to Paul, which is Julius, he stopped it. He said, no, no, we, we're not going to kill them. And Paul led them through this storm. Paul told them, drop the anchors, throw the cargo overboard. And they all, when they went in the water, they grabbed a piece of the ship, whatever they could grab, and they floated to the land nearby, and not a person was lost. Imagine what it would be like if Paul stood up and said, yeah, I told you so, we're all about to die, and it's because of you. We're going down with the ship, no, no. Paul said, let's get this stuff off, let's get it out of the way, and let's get ourselves to the land the best way that we can, and not a prisoner was lost. And Paul still, still had his opportunity to appeal to Caesar and give him the gospel. Don't reject the warnings in life. Don't reject it. There's a price to pay for not accepting Jesus as your Savior. It really is. The question is, are you willing to pay that price? I'm going to tell you, I'm not. I'm not. I choose heaven over hell any day of the week. Not a second thought about it. But he also warned us to live up to his image. How are we doing? Would you pray with me? Father, as I think about a warning, you've warned us on several different things, Father. You've warned us on how we should live, the things that we should do, the things that we shouldn't do. You've warned us of consequences, and you've done so because you're loving. And you want us to escape the harsh judgment that is out there. And Father, we look at judgment as harsh, but we also, I mean, as warning is harsh, but we should also look at the warning 
as love because you're trying to spare us from what is out there, from what we cannot see, from what we do not know. And today, if there's a person in this building today that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray today that they will accept him. They will walk out of here today saying, I know in whom I have believed. I know in whom I have trusted. I know that Jesus is my Lord. Today, work in our hearts and lives. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And as you stand today, if you're looking for a church home, then we want to invite you to come. If you, if you feel led that way, if you need Jesus in your life, I beg you, please do not leave without Jesus in your heart. Leave with, know that he's part of you. Know that your eternity is secure, that everything is the way that it should be. Know that, because you can Jesus loved you and me enough to warn us of what's out there that we cannot see. But he also gave us instructions on how to avoid that. If you, if you don't know him, come to him today. Come to Jesus. Come. Amen. Be a witness for Jesus. Live for him. Let the world see Jesus in you and tell them that Jesus is the love of your life and let them know that because they may need it. And as we leave here today, remember the mission field is outside. This is the place of worship. We're leaving here and we're entering the mission field to be a missionary for the Lord Jesus Christ. So be the best that you can be. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together openly as a way, in the way that we have. And today as we get ready to depart this place, I pray that you will provide opportunities for us to not only share our faith, but to model our faith before the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember the Lord loves you and I love you. And thank you. Until we meet again.